this recording is indeed in progress. Um, this base, this session, right? So Jeff approached me the other day, said, hey, Nigel, would you like to do a session for me and my community? And I said, yeah, great. I've got something I'd like to talk about. I'd like to talk about the Nigel scale. And Jeff said, great. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Like maybe something about, you know, like presentation skills or, or like humor or something. No, yeah, I can talk about that as well, but I really want to talk about the Nigel scale. And Jeff kind of went, okay, well, we'll schedule two sessions. Like, should we do the presentation one first? And I was like, no, we won't be doing the presentation one first, but we're doing the Nigel scale first. Okay, so let me introduce you to the Nigel scale. Okay, the Nigel scale is invented by me. Uh, that's why it's called the Nigel scale. Um, <laughs> if it was invented by someone else, it would have a different name. Um, I'll tell you why I called it the Nigel scale in a moment. But basically, here we go. I've got some slides to you here. Let me share some slides. Everyone loves some slides. There we go. I've got a slide saying Nigel scale. I think that's quite good, don't you think? There we go. Exactly what it says on the tin. Here's the problem, right? So this is me. So I've been, a, I've been in, in IT for a billion, billion years. I started off as a childhood programmer. I've been in IT 27 years. A lot of those years working with Jeff, by the way, many years ago, uh, uh, using Agile over 20 years, I think 20 years now, isn't it? Been an Agile coach, blah, blah, scrum trainer, blah, blah, all these things I've been doing, right? So I've seen a lot of stuff over the years. I've seen lots of interesting stuff. I've seen, as they say in Blade Runner, things you wouldn't believe, okay? And what I've been discovering in the last few years is that um, Jeff and I and people like us, like we were accidentally part of history, but we didn't kind of realize it was history at the time. It was just stuff that happened, right? So let me take you back to about, here we go, about 2009, right? So what's that, 13 years ago? Um, certified scrum trainers, right? Um, we all these certified scrum trainers across the world in the Scrum Alliance are having what is politely known as a discussion. Um, in most worlds, it'll be called a bit of a bar fight. So people are throwing things at each other in a variety of forms, and bickering, um, bickering with each other. And the thing that was the big bugbear 13 years ago was the term agile project managers, right? Which hopefully you all realize now 13 years later it's a bit of an oxymoron. It's like saying military intelligence, you know, or accurate estimates. You know, like one word kind of hits, the other one's not kind of in lined. And so there was a big discussion amongst trainers, some pro the word, some anti the word, all backing and forth. And as internet discussions are wont to do, that discussion went every blooming where. It went off into release planning. It went off into project managers, stroke scrum masters. I don't recommend stroking scrum masters. And it was all generally all over the place. Now, you have to appreciate the context of the time. That world famous scrum guide document that everyone seems to assess about these days had been written one month before and no one was impressed with it, right? It was hugely disappointing. Why? Because we had all been promised something called the scrum hub which was going to be like um, a community, a source of agile knowledge and scrum learning. And it was going to be this wonderful, almost like an encyclopedia of greatness. And what we got was like a 10 page document specifying scrum. And we were kind of all. Oh, OK, um, that's great, I think. Um, I thought we were going to get a bit more, but hey ho, we've given Ken Schwaber all this money. Um, he's given us 10 pages. Great. And at this time as well, they were developing the exam for Certified Scrum Master, like an examination for the end of that training. So you may not realize this, but when CSM started and Jeff and I started teaching it, there was no test because there was no sort of verifiable body of knowledge to test against. So we had to use our own experience and judgment calls on people in courses and go like, you kind of feel quite a bit agile. I guess you're OK. I'm not too sure about you. And that puts you in a really difficult spot. So there was lots of conversations going on at this time, basically around Scrum and that guide. And hang on, what are we teaching in Scrum Master Training? And hang on a minute, what are we going to exam? And there was a big issue here, because frankly, what was in that guide wasn't quite lined up with what people thought Scrum was, which wasn't quite lined up with what people were teaching, because they were teaching other stuff. And it wasn't quite lined up with what we're going to test. 
shenanigans. <laughs> so everyone's arguing and bickering and having a moan. And at this time, I thought, do you know what this conversation needs? This conversation needs just a little bit more trolling involved in it. So what I actually had, <laughs> trolling is a strong term, I admit. You know, maybe, let's say, um, humorous critique. Okay, let's, do, let's use that word. So I posted in this discussion, I said, look, all of you arguing about this stuff, you need to be using the Nigel scale, right? I've been using it for years. I hadn't, I just made it up. That second, right? It's why it's called the Nigel scale. I said, oh, you, you need to use this Nigel scale as a way to help you better understand the conversation. Now, at the time, and again, you may not realize this, there was something that was really popular in the Agile world. It was called the Nokia test. Do you know if anyone's ever heard of the Nokia test? It was very trendy for a little bit. It was effectively a test built by, well, it wasn't Nokia, hilariously. It was Nokia Siemens Networks. And hilariously, it wasn't a test. It was more of a self-assessment. But hey, but it was like a, a little a self-assessment you would give yourselves and judge your relative agility. And at the time, everyone was kind of desperate for anything to help them make judgment calls. So I thought Nokia test, Nigel scale, sounds a bit familiar, aren't I the wit? And what I came up with was the Nigel scale. So here we go. Here's the Nigel scale, patent pending, owned by me, not by you. Just remember this. I'm watching you, Frankie. Mine, not yours. Um, here's the Nigel scale. Nigel scale one. There are things that are a bit scrum guy-tastic. And this is actually, there is stuff that is fundamental, stuff that is like core to everything we do, okay? And if we bend this, or we manipulate this, or we tweak this, we get into a whole heap of trouble. So the example I often use is um, surgery. Imagine you're a surgeon, okay? Or imagine, you know, <laughs> imagine you are a patient about to go in for surgery, and your surgeon comes up to you, and says, hello, I'm your surgeon. I'll be performing the operation. I just want you to know that um, I don't believe in the concept of bacteria. I think bacteria and viruses were invented by Big Pharma as like a grand conspiracy. And so I don't wash my hands before an operation. There's no reason to do so. But how would you feel about that? Or maybe they would say, do you know what? Actually, I don't know if you know this, but bacteria is good for you. Bacteria is good for your body, you know, good for your digestive transit. And so I deliberately dip my hands in cow manure to get loads of good bacteria on it before I perform the operation on you and remove your spleen. How would you feel about that? How would you feel about that? That surgeon, yeah, you'd be like, you'd be like, shut up, shut up, get out. So like, you're not touching me, get away from me. You are grossly incompetent, okay? And so there's like fundamental things that if we bend them, life just gets into a horrible, horrible mess. The problem is, is that most of life isn't that. In the world of complex problem solving, most of our life is here. What I call the Nigel scale two. Um, stuff that Scrum doesn't officially care about. <laughs> the, and this is, this, this is life. There's loads of things in the world of good practice, right? The euphemism of good practice. Hey, it works for them. It works for them. Maybe it'll work for us. Maybe. But then again, maybe not. And that's where as coaches, we have to use our previous experience to coach organizations, to self-organize their own answers to their own complex problems. You know, help them find their own ways. Just because it works for you doesn't guarantee it's going to work for me. And the vast majority of... Okay, so let's have a conversation about this. A lot of what people used to think was Scrum isn't. And I, I, do you know what? I was going to say at this moment, obviously, in 2022, we now know the difference between Scrum and good things done in Scrum. And then I made the fundamental mistake of this morning going on LinkedIn. OK. And that was not wise because there are millions of people on LinkedIn complaining about stuff, going, oh, my God, you know, like oh, that velocity is the, the spawn of the devil. Like, well, it may be the spawn of the devil, but thus Scrum is rubbish. Ah, 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 wind that one back. <laughs> you hate velocity? Legitimate. You saying thus Scrum is rubbish? 
They're two different things. You know, like story points. Good, good idea, maybe. Not compulsory, not part of Scrum. Burn down charts, you know, release planning, standing up in a daily stand up. Hilariously. How, oh, I tell you what, I haven't standed up for stand up in forever. I'm on Zoom. It doesn't, they're all sort of good practices. They're all nice practices, most of them, but they're not that fundamental heart. They're not that fundamental core that if they are fiddled with or adjusted, life fails. You know, like if you sit down for a daily scrum, spoiler warning, the world's not going to explode. You know what I mean? And so we've got to be very careful here because a lot of people seem to confuse what is contextual good practice with like fundamental principle best practice that must be followed by all. And of course, we get to Nigel scale one, two, three, Nigel scale three. There we go. Nigel scale three, which is, of course, there is a notion of bad rubbish. I would have said a rude word, but Jeff is recording. Um, but there's loads and loads and loads and loads of anti-patterns that if you do them, you will hate your life. Um, we can call them anti-agile, but they're just bad ideas. And they're probably bad ideas under most approaches. There is an absolute ocean of those bad ideas, okay? And it's very easy. And this is actually what I said. So this is a direct quote from the post I made 14 odd years ago. And I'm gonna have to read it to you because I can't remember it. I think it's very important to remember which is which. I believe some people are treating that core idea as if it's optional, good practice, and they're treating bad ideas as if they're good ideas. And I think it's good to have lots of good chats on here about best practice ideas, but it's important we can distinguish between one, two, and three. And I'm not sure all of us can yet. I think, and if you don't, if you've ever heard of Scrum, but it was a big issue back in the day, or oh, we're doing Scrum, but we're not doing that utterly vital piece of it. <laughs> um, you know, um, but that phenomenon is when people don't realize where they have flexibility and where they don't have flexibility. And at the time, I realized even in like the high end agile community, there was a confusion on that sort of thing. Okay, that, that was the idea. So I made that post. It had moderate success, by the way. People started using the Nigel scale, referencing the Nigel scale, mocking Nigel for calling it the Nigel scale because it started as a joke and turned into something real. Great, right? Whatever it was, 2009, right? And that's where it should have stayed, really, the idea. But there's an awful lot of bad ideas out there. <laughs> you know, like we've got a tiny little ocean of core fundamentals that we should actually uh, follow. There's a range of good practices we can follow as coaches, scrum masters, etc. But there's an ocean of bad. And so what I did was, um, I'm not trying to um, 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 self-aggrandize here, but I've spoken at a lot of conferences, right? And the reason I speak at conferences is they pay your fees if you speak at the conference. So it really incentivizes you to come up with something new each time. And over many years, I've kind of evolved this Nigel scale idea, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally, right? Well, I've just been doing something else. And by accident, I discovered new things. And what happened was, I'm not gonna go into all this, but what happened was I was very, very interested about a fundamental aspect that I hadn't considered when I started talking about this core good and bad. And this is all the fault of Doctor Who. I don't know if any of you know who Doctor Who is. Um, are you aware of the British TV show Doctor Who? Anyone not aware of Doctor Who, by the way? Anyone like unaware of the concept of the Doctor? Oh, fantastic, you're all aware, time traveling, time lord. I thought it'd be funny to do a presentation based around time, okay? And when I started doing this presentation around time, I, it was really, I was trying to get into the idea of coaches and scrum masters using time as a coaching tool, you know, letting people experiment, letting people try, letting people fail. That was the idea. But I thought, why not put the Nigel scale in? <laughs> it's your most famous thing. And when I put it in, I started talking about the Nigel scale over time. And I very quickly realized things don't stay good. Some good practices decay. Some bad practices sort of um, mature into a good practice with a more mature team. You know, some things are like mayflies, they live fast and die young, and some practices are like elephants and go on forever. And suddenly by looking at it from a time point of view, I realized a lot of us have been speaking about agile in, a, in 2D. 
you know, two dimensions. Is this good or is this bad? You know, is this scrum or is it not scrum? And in fact, the entire idea is these things evolve and change. Wow, I, very, I impressed myself, I have to admit, right? But the greatest thing that happened was this. Just before the world blew up, remember when the world blew up, global apocalypse? No, not that one, the other one. <laughs> no, not that one. The other, not that one, the other global apocalypse we've had. Remember that one? Um, before we did that, I put in for a session in Vienna. And I thought, do you know what? I've got a good idea. Wardley mapping. I don't know if you've heard of Wardley mapping. This is not a session on Wardley mapping, but a really cool technique. I thought, could I combine that with the Nigel scale in some way and do like half an hour session in Vienna? And the answer turned out to be no. I completely failed. I blew it. I couldn't do it. I was literally, but what I discovered was an accidental thing. I reinvented someone else's idea. So in systems thinking, they have these uh, Botge, um, the uh, behavior over time graphs, right? And I had accidentally reinvented their idea. I started plotting the Nigel scale concept over time visually, okay? And this gave me some really, really interesting um, discoveries. Now, bearing in mind, you have already may have discovered this, so you're going to have to pretend now that you're impressed, okay? Just remember that. Practice your... That's a good, that's good, Kevin. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, that's very good, Francesca. Thank you, Frankie. Um, but the idea was looking at stuff over time and seeing how I felt. So, for instance, at the time, a few years ago, planning poker. Let's have a vote, right? So, is planning poker a in the chat box? One, two, three, core, good, bad. Is planning poker a fundamental core principle of agility and scrum? Is it a good practice within scrum or is it a bad practice within scrum and within agile? Vote now, vote now. Don't look at the other votes. Do not look at the other votes. Just vote now. Don't copy other people. Go for it. Go for it. Let's see the votes now. Thank you, Kevin, for at least you, uh, using the scale. Um, oh, oh, hang on. Oh, hang on. OK, yeah. Keep going, keep going, keep going. I don't know if there's any more of us voting. Um, what have we got here? We've got a good, we've got a good. We got a good, we got an okay. Thanks for that, Ashley. Is, sorry, sorry, Nigel, is one core? Or one is, is it, core. One oh, is sorry, core. sorry. I, I meant to say two, three and two then. <laughs> ah, thank you. So, that's what I was about to say. Because obviously, hopefully we all know, it's not actually a core technique. Yeah, some yeah. people treat it like it. Yeah, I've just been working with a company just yeah. a, uh, two weeks ago who literally thought it was like fundamental law. They called it scrum poker. Mm. And it was like, this is the law here. We all, and they actually enjoy it and it's good and that's great. But that is what I think it is myself, yeah. from my experience. You know, actually in a new team, in a new context, it's a really good thing to do. It's really helpful, gets people talking, gets people chatting, but it's got a short half-life. You know, I think James Grenning, who, inv who invented it, he didn't, he reinvented it. Barry Boehm invented it back in the 80s. But even he, I think, stopped after six weeks. They did it for six weeks as a getting going technique. But again, the problem with the world today is you just get people arguing from their own singular point of view. So you get someone here looking down. Jeez, I've just done a vampire. We, OK, there's some vampiric. Um, that was supposed to be a nice normal eye. God, that's monstrous. Let's give it some under. There we go. Make it purely evil. The eye of Sauron here. So the eye of Sauron here looks down and goes, ah. This is good for me, it is universally good. And you get someone else over here who looks down, that's a much better face, and that looks a bit like me, and they go, no, it's a terrible idea. It's awful, how could anyone think it's a good idea? I'm gonna write a LinkedIn article about how planning poker is dead and how it's awful. Right? And someone else going, no, you're an idiot, it's a fantastic idea, how could, and of course, it's all the same elephant, just from different angles. You probably heard the, um, I think it's an ancient Indian story, but I'm not sure. Uh, but the story of the, um, uh, the blind people or the wise men who are blindfolded and touch an elephant. One touches the ear and goes, ah, it's obviously a fan. And one touches the trunk and goes, How, a fan? It's a snake. And the other one touches the tail and goes, snake? It's obviously a rope. And of course, they're all correct. It's all the same elephant, just from a different angle. And I think we, as coaches, scrum masters, uh, advocates, we need to appreciate this third dimensionality to it, this decay. Of course, then you get something like um, 
affinity based estimation or magic estimation i believe it's called in germany you know that's the one where you sort of lay out the cars and put the scale on afterwards do it silently often again try that with a new team with no experience they often drown but in a reasonable age team it's a really powerful idea so great that's wonderful that's good news to know we know we now know that horses for courses as they say you know, this practice decays this practice grows but What's the interesting thing about this picture? Okay, uh, let me rephrase that. What's the interesting thing for me about this picture? You or me? Well, well, well if for you, you can jump in, but I'm trying to get to guess my mind. What do you think I find interesting about this picture? Actually, saying the intersection, uh, Kevin saying the intersection. Is that yeah, that bit. That's what interests me, right? Because that's an interesting conversation, isn't it? Like, it's all well and good saying one decays and one improves, but what do you do when you hit that nexus point? And we can't use nexus, can we? It's copyrighted. When you hit that point yeah. in the middle, because <laughs> there's so yeah, that's what's interesting to me. It's like okay, so. What do we do there? And I think this is a conversations people don't have enough of, which is not like, this is good, this is bad, this is bad, this is good, but ing, changing, you know, growing, improving, the act of um, transition, the act of motion. I think that's interesting because you could do a hard swap, couldn't you? On a Tuesday morning, go, right team, you know, I've got a new uh, estimation technique I'd like to show you. Or could the team hybridize it? You know, sort of mix the two together, sort of blend them as they grow. Could they run them in parallel? You know, do both and see which one they like and, and then fade one out over time. These are all options in that scenario. But I think this is the sort of stuff we should be talking more about, about in changing, improving, not necessarily just that is good, that is bad, very, very categorizing. Now, oh, of course, you could mention things like no estimates as well. Of course, no estimates, movement, you know, chop it and count or whatever you want to do. Again, a, probably a great technique. A lot of people talk about it online as if it's the, the, um, the, the, the changing of the world, you know, chopping and counting stories or some equivalent model. But a lot of people look at it and they drown because they're like, well, that's not my context. I can't imagine what that looks like. I can't imagine the context. I'm not in that space yet. That makes it a hard sell, doesn't it? A lot of things we've got to talk about here. Um, oh, that's interesting. Uh, refinement and sprint planning, you know? When do you, or backlog refinement in general. Uh, if you do it in sprint planning, probably a bad idea. <laughs> like, oh, should we spend five hours breaking the backlog up and then we'll spend five hours decomposing into tasks? Team, 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 come back, team, come back. You know, just like, maybe they wouldn't appreciate that. So a lot of people, what do they do? There we go, let's jump forward. A lot of people, there we go, that's what I'm looking for, do have a backlog refinement meeting, don't they? You know, in the previous sprint, maybe they'll have a meeting where they all come together, do some backlog refinement. Nice. But is that good? Well, it probably starts off okay, but we've all been in those meetings after a few months and we've been, <laughs> it's still three hours. So people then start talking about having meetings, you know, multiple meetings in a sprint. Lovely. Some people even have it that, you know, they don't have a meeting at all. They just do it just in time. You know, they, they do their backlog refinement as and when they need to do so. But again, think of the profile of that. Think how it flows. Like for me, I think the journey is interesting here. You know, maybe I'll start off with having one meeting, you know, but as it starts decaying, maybe, oh, will we maybe start heading off into multi-meetings? Then maybe we can get into that just in time approach. But I think, and this is what was interesting for me, these graphs, you know, I said they're not Wardley maps. I, I couldn't make Wardley maps work. Well, actually, you can use these graphs a bit like a map to help you have some conversations. So you map out these patterns, and then you start thinking, okay, how am I going to maneuver my way through these patterns? Imagine there's sort of lines on a map. How am I going to head here? How do I get to here? How can I spot when this condition is approaching? I think having a visualization like that can help you on that journey and help you just ask yourself some more difficult questions in there. What else is there? What else is there? Oh, yeah, that was me drawing a, a, a potential pathway we could take through. But of course, you wouldn't do that. It could just be, it's just one example. 
what else is there? Oh yeah, this is another interesting one for me. So like classically, Scrum Master is core, right? Scrum Master is core, absolutely core part of Scrum, fundamental. Yet just this week, I'm working with a large company that has no Scrum Masters, none, none at all, right? None at all. Now, bear in mind, this company has been doing agile for, tag, let's rephrase that. They've been claiming agility for, I would say, nearly 10 years, nearly. So where have the Scrum Masters gone? Where have the Scrum Masters gone? Can people now make up a reason why a company would claim they don't need Scrum Masters anymore? In the chat box now, please, in the chat box, give me your best, what would a company say to claim they don't need Scrum Masters? Let's see, let's see what, let's see what excuses we can come up with for this, right? They have amazing, yes, exactly is number one, right? They have amazing empathic product owners. Our managers know Scrum. This is exactly what they say. We have agile coaches. This is also exactly what they said. Exactly. Um, the team is self-powered enough and they're all awesome. Yes, we've heard that one as well, right? And it's all free on the internet. Um, so all those are completely true. Oh, we rotate. They didn't even do that. They did that for a while. It didn't work very well. So they decided the concept of Scrum Mastery was rubbish. It's kind of like homeopathy, watering it down to make it stronger. But they said exactly those things because they, they thought, oh, our agile coaches can cover it. They couldn't. Our product owners are amazing and empathic. By the way, they are and dying because that's why I was there. The POs were dying. They were just like, save us. It's just awful. We can't do all this. We can't cope, you know? And so it's interesting because there's always been a conversation in the agile space, especially around sort of um, the extreme programmers who came along. They've always thought, I think, of Scrum Mastery as a short-term role, as a role that can uh, dissipate over time, you know, a role that can dissolve, you know? We think once we know about the daily Scrum for a while, we don't need someone there saying, team, Team, daily scrum time. What, again? Like this, uh, every day? You know, but of course, they miss the fundamental part of it, isn't it? That like there's actually a fundamental core of scrum mastery that is far more crucial, which is the coaching side. You know, to, for me, that is the absolute heart. And I think actually scrum masters in reality sort of grow into their jobs a little bit. They start off a bit crap. <laughs> you know, not quite. We all, we all, we were all there. Oh, I don't know what I'm doing. We start off being not so great and grow into that role as we build those relationships, as we build that trust, as we build that rapport. I feel actual scrum masters evolve into that role and deliver more value in that role. Once I start knowing the organization, knowing the team, knowing the people, the team starts self organizing, I can really start helping them improve the work, improve the business. And I'm worried a bit about that because I think that that sort of there's that secret background thought of people that think of Scrum Mastery as temporary, Scrum Mastery as ephemeral, Scrum Mastery as a, as a hat, when it's actually a fundamental core heart of what we need to do. What else is there in here? So I've been doing graphs and loads of things, by the way. Uh, this is my latest one. So this, this is why I wanted to do Nigel Scale with you, because I was just having this conversation in another company. And as we were talking about it, and as I was drawing it, I had a bit of a revelation. Again, a revelation you may already have had, <laughs> but never let it be said that I am quick. Um, and so product backlog estimation, okay? The magical world of story points. I think the world's been talking a lot about story points recently, a lot about story points. And if you read LinkedIn or read any, any article anywhere, where do story points fall? Oh, but that's not rhetorical. And now I want an answer in the box. I'm so sorry. Let's get an answer. Okay, good practice. Can we come with bad practice? Here's an interesting thought for you, right? I go to a lot of companies, right? And they talk, oh, we do story points here. We're struggling with story points. We're struggling with them, okay? I'm like, okay, struggling with them, okay. We're struggling, yeah. And I say, okay, well, what are you struggling with? Well, you know, they're hard to use, I don't know. Um, and some companies say, well, it's not too bad here. And I say, why? Well, we say one day a point, and then it's not too hard. You know, one, one, one ideal day a point. And I'm kind of like, hmm. But it's not, they're not measuring ideal days. 
And they go, oh, I know. So we changed it to half a day a point. So it's no longer 1.1 day, <laughs> half a day a point. And I'm like, I think you're missing the point here. <laughs> like, I think someone's missing the point here. And so, so, so what about, okay, what about this then? Very popular at the moment still. There we go, let's go for this one. Ideal days. Why don't we do ideal days in our backlog then? Have some ideal days in our backlog. So is that, is that, let's talk about that one then. Let's go, is that, is that core good or bad? 2.5. Do you think? Any other votes at all? Two to three, three to one. Yeah, it's... Okay, so this is what I was having a chat about. I had, okay, here's the thing, right? So I've done some work recently and the last, uh, I've been doing a lot of stuff with Chet Hendrickson, right? So Chet Hendrickson is one of the first, one of the extreme programmers. Like he was on the first Chrysler Extreme Programming team. Um, he was involved in the creation of extreme programming. Um, he was, didn't write the books. Famously, Chet is incredibly grumpy because he didn't go to the Snowbird Ski Lodge in February 2001 for the summit because he thought, oh, Kent, Kent's going, Ron's going. I don't like the snow. Oh, I'll just stay at home. I can't be bothered. Right? And so he basically said, I can't be bothered. You guys go, I'll, I'll stay. You don't need me. And of course, now he's not one of the 17. And people always ask, are you one of the 17 Agile founders? And he's like, no, but I was invited. Anyway, but he was telling me something really interesting. So he was saying with extreme programming, they went, they experimented loads. They tried out loads of ideas. They failed on so many things in Chrysler before. They were trying out all these ideas. Kent had all these ideas. They were experimenting, experimenting. And then they had, they came to a shape that really worked for them, for the, for the payroll system. It really worked. And Kent and other people wrote the books on extreme programming. But what Chet said, he said, I, I, I think we made a mistake. He goes, what I think we should have written a book about it's not what we ended up at, but the journey we went on. You know, that would have been interesting, you know, because people have been copying what we did. Like, oh, extreme programming, I'll do that in my company. Oh, it doesn't work. Not, but I think they would have got so much more if they had, if we had explained our choices, why we made our choices, the, choice, the journey we took, because that would have helped them make better choices in their own worlds. Because like famously, they went, they've been on this journey. <laughs> they've been through the real time, you know, classic estimation where it's very contextual and fragile and rubbish and moved to ideal days. They were using ideal days and got burnt. It's why Ron Jeffries invented story points, effectively knocking the units off so people couldn't come back in three days and see where they were. And I realized perhaps to actually really get points to work, you have to have done the other stuff. Perhaps you can't, perhaps just jumping into points without any context is a really blooming difficult thing for people to do. And this is what interests me. Well, let's go this way, correct way, there we go, there we go. That type of thing, right? And this, when I did that presentation um, on time, Time Lord, by the way, I dressed up at Do as Doctor Who as well, um, just for the presentation. It was very good. Um, but I had this dream of there being like, methods that start off poor become good and fade into poor again you know methods with an actual birth life and death but i couldn't actually identify any in that presentation but i think story points is that technique i think it's a technique that if you start with a new team it's really blooming hard really difficult to get the point across <laughs> really difficult to get them to understand right but ideal days everyone knows but they're a bit crap <laughs> it's a bit rubbish and so maybe starting with ideal days is a good idea you know, I think we used to say this back in British Telecom when Jeff and I worked there. You say, like, you could do ideal, they start there, maybe trans, because just people were so behind the times, even doing things like ideal days was a bit of a challenge for them. But maybe starting off with ideal days, understanding it's not good, but it's a transition technique to get you onto something better. And then understanding things like points are good to a certain point. But if your work starts getting stable in size and similar sized, all of a sudden you don't even need to point. You can just count and chop and count like they do in the no estimates or do some sort of measurement like the, um, I'm a bit, I'm not anti the lean thing, but Monte Carlo, I think I'm a bit worried because that's kind of applying a manufacturing metaphor to stuff that is not repeatable, which always makes me a bit nervous. But generally there are techniques out there that could become 
opportunities or directions for the more mature team. But if we know this and we understand this, then we can start some interesting conversations on things. But okay, I'll start here with this, knowing it will fade. And I know this one won't work yet, but I can bring this one on over time. So as a coach, you're sort of layering on techniques. Like with, um, you know, Jeff talks about like player-led coaching, et cetera, in his stuff. Well, I know nothing about that, but I watch my kids get taught tennis. And it's really interesting to see the tennis coach layer on techniques. Originally, outside tennis, actually, by the way, layering on techniques so the children learn and then they can bring it to the game of tennis, which I found very fascinating. And so that idea of not being splat everything, you know, the idea of layering and building and growing as a coach, your methods and approaches as a scrum master, taking them away after a while. Say, okay, this technique's decaying. Let's cut it back. Let's garden these processes rather than just layer them on. Now, interesting, both it made a really interesting point here about the safe recommendation. Well, recommending safe is always a deadly thing to do at the best of times. But maybe there is a place, uh, this is an awful thing, almost heresy, because I am renowned for absolutely hating safe and everything it stands for. But maybe there's a place for it, but not how they sell it. Literally as a transition mechanism to get you off of the bad stuff onto the better stuff. The metaphor I have used, trigger warning, but it's the only metaphor I can think of, I apologize in advance, is methadone. Don't know if you know methadone, but where I grew up, I went to a really rough school, very rough. And a lot of the people I went to school with, about half of them, I would say, maybe an exaggeration, but not too bad, um, got into heavy drugs, heroin, right? And luckily, a lot of them are coming out of that now in their 40s. They're, they're getting off of it, right? And so I know a few of them are on methadone which is a, a drug used to help you transition off of heroin, okay? Um, now, if you've ever looked up methadone as a drug, it's awful. It's absolutely awful as a drug, the, the medicare, what it does to you. It's an awful thing, but it's better than heroin. And so when you're on it, the idea is to transition you off of it. Like you use it as a, tech, a pathway to free you. And that's kind of not saying safe is like a legal drug, but... Um, but maybe as a pathway to a better future, some of those heavy methods could have a place, but we've got to be very careful with them. Sometimes the cure can be worse than the, uh, the treatment can be worse than the cure. I know I mentioned heroin, very famously, that's diamorphine, which was invented to try and get people off of morphine addiction. So we've got to be a little bit careful here and understand that if we're going to get into this world of introducing techniques and removing techniques, we need to be aware of how the techniques are shaped. So not part of this presentation, but one thing I've been trying to write about a lot more is, you know, safe to fail experiments. We always talk in Agile about safe to fail, safe to fail experiments. Well, unfortunately, some processes are like uh, bee stings, you know, like a bee sting or like a harpoon, where it's easy to introduce the technique, but hard to withdraw it. You know, hard to take the technique back out again. And those are things we've got to be very careful of as coaches. Because oh, we'll put this in for now, but don't worry, we'll take it out later when the team gets better. Oh no. And the thing is wedged in there. By the way, can you think of any, quickly, just give me in the chat box, can you think of any things, tools, techniques that are a little bit beasting, a little bit harpoon, easy to introduce, hard to remove? Can you think of anything at all? Maybe in your world, easy to introduce, hard to remove? Because there is one I see all the time, all the time, all the time, <laughs> all the time, all the time, <laughs> which is, um, again, I'm not here to bad mouth. I'm not here to criticize. But what I will say, Jira, the world, the wonderful world of Jira, easy to introduce. A company goes, we're going agile. We need an agile tool. Oh, Atlassian have got a suite we can purchase. Oh, it's so easy. But once it's in, oh boy, oh boy, is it hard to get out. You know, it's wedded into your infrastructure. And so just be a little bit careful with that type of thing, because that can be really hard to remove. And there's more, there's more, there's more. You know, we could get into if we wanted to. Things like um, 
engineering split backlog items tasks you know tasking as a concept you know it's not compulsory but it's probably a good idea in a, in a in a new team but tasking your work may not be a great idea in a mature team but it's important to understand things like the scrum guide are what i call a lagging metric remember when jeff and i were scrumming you had to task you had to size them in hours if i remember correctly it was like compulsory it wasn't and so you just have to appreciate that a little bit as well. Like the, the good advice follows behind. <laughs> it's like, it's lagging. So I just, just be a little bit aware of that. What else is there to talk about? Oh, and then we go. Okay, breaking down stories, not breaking down stories. You know, as you mature, probably working on small stories with no tasking is a good idea, maybe. Um, uh, could there be a place for story pointing tasks? I don't know, um, but I do know some people use it as a transition to get from um, real-time estimation of tasks onto no estimation of tasks. Though you notice in my drawing, I didn't have the guts to everywhere put it near a good idea, <laughs> just less bad. Um, but it could come less of bad, less bad, bad again. Uh, but what's more interesting to me, I'm gonna jump forward a little bit here, is not so much that, not so much that, that's interesting actually, but one, I'm going to jump forward this one, actually. I'm going to come back to this in a second. Come back to that a second. So I want to show you. No, go away. This is what I want to show you. Should your PO be in your retrospective? Yes. Right. That's the official answer. Yes, core PO part of retro. But if you bring, if your PO is not part of the retro, you are bad, not bad, bad, bad scrubbing. But real life, you know, like if your PO turns up and says, hello, I'm your new PO. I'm here to help accelerate the, sorry, let me rephrase that. Hello, I am your new product owner. I am here to facilitate the enhancement of your roadmap. I will see that you are working hard enough. The joke being that if you haven't got rapport, if you haven't got a relationship, your PO could feel like an adversary. And if you bring that person into the retro, maybe the retro won't work very well, but we want to get them into the retro, you know? So again, it's about how, it's the transition, isn't it? It's ideals this, reality's that. You can't just go think and hope everything's going to work. Hope is not a strategy. I need to work out how am I going to build that rapport, build that relationship, build that trust over time and bring them in. And this is the point I wanted to get to. The entire point of the word coach is get somewhere quicker. You know, who coach comes from coach, because like the actual physical coaches get somewhere quicker. So that's what interests me. Not so much should they be in or out, but how can I transition them into the experience quicker and more effectively without ruining the team and ruining their own dynamic? You know, and what could happen to slow that down? <clears throat> what could happen to make that longer and slower? and worse. So what anti-patterns could we do to make it more difficult to bring our PO as part of the experience? So jumping backwards, pretend you haven't seen this. Um, but this one here is interesting, just like retros, you know, retros age out really quickly with their fundamental, their core, but they age. You know, if you do the same retro more than a few times, teams get bored quickly. And we've all been in retros, like 44th version of the same retro. And everyone's just dying a death. So what did you do? What did you do well this sprint? Teamwork. What what should we do differently this sprint? Testing. Uh, what, what did you learn? What did you learn? What did you learn this sprint? Nothing. <laughs> what what barriers do you have? What, what what did you what 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 puzzles you? Everything. You know, <laughs> what action should we take? Let's stop doing these bloody things. And so, like, the joke is, like, there are meta patterns as well, where we need to kind of say, okay, if retros decay quickly, we need to keep changing the retro, don't we? We need to keep changing the method to keep people interested, keep people engaged, maybe change the topic, maybe change the focus, but all things to keep that interesting and engaging. And so by visualizing it, you can start seeing, okay, it's not a case of just, just do this. It's a case of, okay, we need to revolve and rotate some of these practices to give novelty factor at least, or to give a new direction or a new idea or a new thought to keep people fresh and refreshed in the experience. And again, visualizing, you can come up with meta patterns like this 
when you okay now i can see the pattern now i can see perhaps what i need to do about it and there's more and more and more right <laughs> i'm getting bored with my own voice um but you know we've done this done this done this let's look at this one uh what's this one yeah like sprint locking <laughs> Remember sprint locking? How sprints used to be locked and you couldn't change them on pain of death. Like there used to be like um, a ceremony you had to do um, to uh, break your sprints. I can't remember what it was again. Was it like what was it, Jeff? Again, I can't remember. You had to lay down and scream or something, or lay down, kick your legs, and scream. Yeah, yeah, kick your legs, scream. Um, and of course, people took that seriously when it was just uh, Ken making a joke in a training course. And this is another big problem with our world, which is people fetishizing um good practices into best practices so say oh i once saw in a training course ken said we had to sit in a circle and scream and then they go back to work and try and implement that as best practice policy it's kind of like mm, maybe not you know maybe maybe you're missing the joke there but he always used to be sprints are locked good sprints unlocked bad right and of course as we all know life's not as simple as that um are sprints locked hmm <laughs> <laughs> no changes are made that would endanger the sprint goal. Oh, so they're locked. But scope may be clarified and renegotiated. Oh, so they're not locked. Um, so there's a bit of youth, a bit of wobbly hand, and even in the scrum guide. But generally, and we all know this, in immature teams with new to the tech, probably it's a good idea to keep sprints bounded and protected so they don't get uncontrolled change happening to their faces every five minutes. You know, yet a mature team running a Kanban approach who knows how to do it minimizes work in progress good code quality continuous integration yada 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 you know what locking sprints is no longer needed and so again it's like having a 2d guide trying to cover both worlds in one statement ends up covering neither world you know because the the villains will go ah scope may be clarified and renegotiated <laughs> okay hi team hi hi team let's have a quick renegotiation of my scope I think you're going to get a lot more done and uh, commit to more now or you're all fired. How's about that? And yet, and so I think we've got to be, again, how we communicate this is important. Understanding this nuance, maybe visualising, helps people get a better appreciation of why we do things the way we do and why a good idea may be a good idea. What else have I got here? Oh, gosh, jeez, 10 minutes to go. So I got fundamentally carried away with this, right? I horribly carried away with this idea, massively carried away. So I started saying, okay, can we start like mapping things like Shu Hari onto this? You know, the Shu Hari concept for martial arts, Shu sort of follow the martial arts slavishly, uh, like Karate Kid, wax on, wax off. Um, you don't know why, but you're following the moves. Ha, you're the black belt, you understand, you're stretching the martial art, you know the martial art. And Ri is your Bruce Lee, you are, the martial arts like you whatever you do is the martial art whatever the martial art is you do you live and breathe it like my favorite thing in life is alistair coburn on the agile 17 he's such an agile person like everything that comes out of his mouth is pretty much agile you know it's like he as a human being it just exudes from his from his pores you know and so i started saying okay like we could use that model perhaps on the on the uh, nigel scale to help us say okay follow a process, bend a process, transcend a process. But then I started getting horribly carried away again and said, okay, but what about the organization? That's a dimension we haven't mentioned yet. When we talk about like shoe or a learner, that's a, maybe a team, your team, but what does the organization look like? Because I feel there are organizational gravitational forces on your work and on your methods. So let's say you're a really cool team. That's great. Oh, we're high, we're advanced. But in a shoe organization, there is pressure on your methods. You know, oh, come on, come on. Points are nice, but, you know, we need to report back to the customers in days. You know, putting heat on your estimation or maybe saying, oh, Kevin, Kevin, no, I agree. That's really agile, Kevin. Thank you for sharing your agility. That's why we hired you, Kevin. That's why we hired you. But you know what? We're new to this agile thing. Maybe we'll just have the project managers doing the scrum mastery at the moment, just at the moment to get things going, you know. And it's all sort of gravitational forces pulling your bad practice to try and pretend it's viable or making core practice and try and pretend it's conditional. Frankie.
I know self-organization is a really important thing. But in this organization, we believe in more of a meritocracy where the cream rises to the top and then makes the decisions for the rest of them. And I, thanks, <laughs> but if we're not gonna self-organize, we're not doing scrum, we can't even call it agile, we'll call it something else. Hell? No, maybe, but whatever name you're gonna give it, it's gonna be agony. So that's why I've been on to now, really. This is really why I've been here, yeah, don't go there. This is what I've been experimenting with now, is like mapping other things to this. Oh yeah, Kenevin, bit of Kenevin, get a bit of Kenevin in there. Um, but for instance, again, I think we don't define our terms. So they say 101 in like any form of scientific paper, define your terms before you start talking about it. Because when you say complexity, that may not be what someone else means with complexity. And I do find a lot of what we're doing is this crashing into each other because each person's got a different interpretation of what they're actually talking about. Like, for instance, there may be clear parts of your work where certain <laughs> things work well, but it doesn't mean they'll work well in the complicated world of software development or the complex world of product development. And so maybe we could see, and I haven't done this, so don't panic. I haven't drawn anything for this. Calm down. But what I'm interested about is just the idea of those different contexts and what effect they would have on practice. And I think we just need to be aware of that a little bit more. Oh, oh yeah. You could even get into Kent Beck stuff, explore, expand, extract. Kent, which is very similar to Kenevin in its own way, but Kent Beck's idea of, you know, there being situations where you're exploring, you're discovering, you're trying to find your fit, then expand as you found your fit and you're trying to grow it into new markets, grow it into new dimensions and extract his, you're a mine and you can keep mining. You know, you've got, you've, there's nothing new. You're just looking to get money out of the old quarries. And again, you know, we spoke about safe earlier on. Could there be an argument that if you're in a, an extract situation of product development where there's nothing new coming, you're just looking to exploit and pull more value out of pre-existing quarries, maybe something that looked a bit safey would be legitimate as an organizational structure. But if you're looking to explore or expand, it almost certainly wouldn't be having that fixed structure in place. Uh, Coaching stances. These are my stances. I stole them from my wife, by the way, because my wife was a teacher. She was taught these, um, you know, like the idea of um, you know, famously consult, tell, collaborate, work together, coach. They have the answer, not you. Or character, role model it. Or even silence, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> but could you use those stances and think about how you use stances on process depending on the situation? I don't want it to be algorithmic, which I haven't done it, but I do think it's an interesting conversation to have with yourself, thinking, okay, just being aware. I've got a team in this situation. I've got a practice that does this. How can I best approach that as a coach? What starts would be best for me in this situation, in this moment, and be able to swap between stances so you don't just end up blasting one stance forever in every conversation you know I, I have i use all the stances as long as it's tell and consult just tell people what to do so there could be some interesting conversations there um oh yeah if you want to learn more if for some reason i don't know why you would want to by the way i have no idea why you would want to but if for some reason you're crazy enough to think do you know what that sounded interesting can i get even more on that um there is videos available um, I did a video on Nigel Scale versus scaling frameworks. So taking that core good bad model and actually analyzing the top um, four methods, you know, so Nexus, less safe, scrum at scale, and using that model to sort of lens to look at and to judge basically those models, which I thought was quite interesting. It's a very popular video, got thousands of views, so it's quite popular on there. Um, there's also a video, if again, if you're interested, just in terms of using the Nigel Scale on scrum itself on the scrum guide because each time they adjust scrum here's the thing i feel that ken and jeff are trying to make scrum core right so they're trying to make scrum just the fundamental core that everyone has to really do right a lot of people think core equals scrum which is a slightly different algorithm if you think about it. Like, okay, so it's Scrum, thus it's core. Eh, it should be 
its core, thus it's in Scrum, okay? But every time they give Scrum a little tweak every couple of years, I get a bit twitchy sometimes because often you get unexpected things start happening. Um, this is not the video for that. Hey, those of you watching on video, did you make it this far? Uh, but for the live audience, if you want to go more and learn more about that, you can watch this video. Okay, it's from a two years ago Scrum Guide update, but they haven't updated it since. Just talking through some of those changes and how we can look at it from a Nigel scale approach. It was interesting, I felt. And also quite popular online. Uh, yeah, oh, and by the way, this is not just me. Okay, the Nigel scale is me, but if you look at other communities, other communities seem to be having similar ideas. So Dan Vacanti has come up with like, you know, ProKanban.org. And they really seem to be getting back to a back to basics Kanban approach, getting away from sort of the lean Kanban university noise of, of, of that has come before, sort of getting back to basics, keeping it lean. And I think that's quite interesting. Obviously, I've never heard of the Nigel scale, but I think it'll be interesting to apply that across what they're doing and seeing what they feel is actually core and what's crept into those approaches. And oh, there's a couple of things here. I've made a big assumption, right? I've assumed. <laughs> <laughs> time to be linked to experience and experience to be linked to learning, right? And that is a big assumption. With those graphs, I think there is a possibility that some people could end up in like a time loop, you know, trapped forever in uh, uh, early experiences. Um, I don't have the talent or intellect to map that sort of z-dimensional thinking on a graph but i think it would i'd just be aware of that i'm making an assumption here that teams will get better if you keep them together work together etc cetera, etc cetera. and that's the conclusion really that's the conclusion since we're at the end of time it's all about ing all about ing changing scaling improving learning uh, agility is for me about transition about motion about the third dimension you know fourth dimension in terms of time depth and, and time, not just this two-dimensional pictures, they keep showing everyone. And so that's what I'm trying to work on still. Agility, agilitying, agilifying is the word we could use if it wasn't already owned by one of our friends. <laughs> but the idea of that idea of motion, I think is important for us as coaches, because the term coach comes from coach, moving vehicle, <laughs> moving item, an item that moves, it is not static, you yeah? know? But there we go. And that's me done. I got there within one so minute. I think we've had that. Say again. Tristan wants to know if it's a maturity model before he runs away. Yeah, no, fuck off. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> no, uh, but I made a joke about that because you could see people easily saying, oh, we are a shoe organization, thus we must do X. We're a hard organization. I could see people doing that. And again, all they're trying to do is take a really delicate third dimensional picture and just take a slice of it and treat that as a, as, as a model. You know, I think it's like, it's like, I don't know. I don't know the metaphor, but taking a slice of something three-dimensional, I think is a pretty bad idea. Not thinking of doing the, uh, the Nigel test then, like the Muffle test. How do you know about that? <laughs> I tell you that? No, 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 not at all. No, well, it'd be like three, it takes, you can do the Nigel test, take the Nigel scale, apply it to anything, and then see what results you get. Because of course, the joke is, I think it'll be interesting to see where people agree and disagree as well it's because what i think is core may not be what you think is core which is interesting as well cool thanks Nigel. any questions the great man <laughs> anyone said not questions at all anyone just want to make statements masquerading as questions that's normally the best thing to do after a session isn't it saying well uh, i i feel a thought No. Not I, cool. I saw you twice delivering this talk in person and here, and both times has been amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's changed since last time. The story points thing was added in the middle. Story points was added. Um, yeah, if you're interested, just stay in touch. Um, I I keep adding things to this. I'm just trying to. I'm trying. I, there's no value in this to anyone but me, I think. But I'm just trying to understand better for me why people clash on this stuff. And I think they're missing that aspect of the conversation, that motion, that dimension. Peter. Peter. Hi, Nigel, Jeff. Um, hi. hi. I joined half an hour late, uh, but I still wanted to join to hear you. Um, I'm curious about the first question I heard when I joined, which was, what is the excuse that you hear for not having uh, 
proper scrum master embedded in the team, as in a scrum master is a role hat. So in um, one of the places I'm in at the moment, there is this thing about we need delivery leads, not scrum masters. Mm -hmm. And it's always, it's a company-wide rule that there are no, uh, it's it's only a role hat. What do you say in response to all those excuses you get? I'm just curious to know what, how you might um, react or respond or do about it. I just want to know what, what the delivery lead does. So what, what was missing that they needed that role? My impression is they wanted, as a policy, they wanted to make sure things go through the door. They want someone who's accountable, uh, one person that's accountable, whether something goes through the door or not. Probably, possibly, this is a new um, client, so I cannot claim to know everything mm -hmm. about them just yet. But probably and possibly, this thing about team being responsible uh, together, maybe it's a bit too woolly for them. Because yeah, I, I get worried about where's the product owners in this scenario, like because they're the ones who are accountable for the delivery. So, do they exist or not exist? You know, that's that's normally. They, where um, the funnily enough, in this particular organization, um, when they moved to Agile, a lot of project managers were given a role title of product owners, mm. but then um, slowly they are they're getting better um, product owner savvy, if you like. And I think slowly also feeling the pain of a lack of a real scrum master. Yeah. I, yeah. I, 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 there's, my big thing is, well, I've got to say one thing for anyone goes, if you want to buy Agile Bear merchandise, we have a red bubble page where you can buy Agile Bear t-shirts with a range of sarcastic Agile statements on it. Advert over, but I've got to make some money out of this thing. Um, but Geetha, like my big issue is, is like process is scar tissue. Right. So this is happening not because there's context. Something's happened somewhere that has burnt someone that meant they're doing this. And what I would be interested to find out is what that is. Because mm. then once I find out what that is, then I can help them find an answer that lines up more with our principles. So it could be, for instance, like they did the old scrum self-organizing team thing with rather than all of us be responsible, none of us are responsible. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so we get away with everything scot-free and I can see how that could bother a company and so but once I find why the gap exists then I can start tracing through an argument to say okay I can see what happened I can see why you think this is a good idea but there's some other options here as well you know yeah, in yeah. terms of sort of like you know coaching and that sort of side of the conversation improving and so that's what I would try and do to try and find out myself yeah. um but I've seen, uh, to be honest, I've seen everything <laughs> recently. <laughs> the last few weeks, I don't know what's happened. People have just gone mad. And I'm just seeing like some weird and wonderful concoctions coming up from organizations. And again, you want them to own their agility. So we've got to be a little bit careful. You know, if we go in saying scrum's the answer, what's the question? <laughs> you know, it's kind of like uh, we're kind of being the most unagile people ever. Um, yeah. Having said all that, <laughs> like if they don't believe in facilitation, coaching and self-organization, it's going to be a hard slog, you know, doing anything. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, no, good one. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Nige. No problem. When's the next one? When's the next one? Indeed. I can't remember. But basically, the next one is going to reference this one. Uh, not the content, thank God. You're not doing that again. But hopefully we're going to talk about like presentation and visualization and storytelling and those types of things. And we'll try and use this as kind of an example to reference forward that one. That's the idea. Anyway. Friday the 17th of June. What, what's the date? Friday the 17th of June. Excellent. So what I'll do is I'll watch this video back. Now, if I don't reference this video on the 17th of June, you will all realize I watched the video. And went, oh God, oh God, oh God, <laughs> oh God, I can't use that. And we'll do another conversation instead. Okay, but that's the idea. Cool. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks, Thank Jessica. you. Thank you. Have a lovely weekend. Uh, Jeff, are these calls usually 4.15 to 5? As, uh, uh, oh, sorry, 4, yeah? Is that there's, the no, there's no real normal. Right. I, okay. I'm not as organized as that, Gita. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thanks.
Cheers. Right, Joe, aren't you, Jeff? That's how it is. <laughs> I'm, I'm beholden to the, uh, the, the, the vagaries of the people that I get in, so. Right, okay. <laughs> I'll just I'll look out then. Yeah. It's really enjoyed today. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, everyone. Bye.